Welcome back to Raised by Giants, where we talk all things spirituality. I'm Ryder Lee. Tonight, we have returning guest, author, and researcher Christopher John Bjorkness speaking about the forbidden history of the Armenian genocide. But before I introduce him, check out Raised by Giants on Rockfin. It is a completely uncensored platform. Go over there, set up a free account, get all of my regular content I post here on YouTube, and sign up for Rockfin's premium content, which is far less than a YouTube premium account at only $10 a month. And you'll get all of my premium uncensored content when it gets released and all of the other creators premium content as well, like Beyond Classified, Charlie Robinson, Jay Dyer, Zero with Sam Tripoli, Tinfoil Hat, Eddie Bravo, and Rex Bear Leak Project, and much more. Check the link in the description to sign up for the video streaming platform, Rockfin. Also, check out C60 Purple Power. It is the most powerful antioxidant on the planet. Helps with energy levels, skin problems, infections, eyesight, brain cognition, EMF radiation, and a lot more. It's a free radical sponge that gives your body the ability to heal itself. And if you use promo code GIANTS10 from the link in the description, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. I highly recommend it. I've been using it for over a year with my own money, and I wouldn't recommend something that doesn't work. Introducing tonight's returning guest, Christopher John Bjorkness. He is a researcher and author best known for his scholarly investigations of the origin and occult beliefs of Christianity, Gnosticism, and the Kabbalah, as well as the taboo history of the world wars and the Armenian genocide. He has published more than 20 books on these subjects and more. Hello and welcome back to the show, Christopher Good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm amazing. And uh, people really, really enjoyed our last show together. And uh, you've written a new book since the last time we talked called The Forbidden History of the Armenian Holocaust. And it's kind of an amalgamation of your work, I believe. And But before we really get into that, I, I know that this is like a, a broad question um but it, it's kind of you know what you've been talking about this entire time how much do you think our society and our culture has been influenced by some sort of religion or a cult you know just in the world either economically socioeconomically because it really seems you'd like you can't get away from it Right. Even if you just claim to be an an atheist, you've been programmed uh, to a certain degree with religious values, even if you don't actively practice them. Right. And I oh, feel absolutely. Like, yes. Yeah. And I really feel like that this has just trickled down and become something way bigger than it ever really should have. So. Again, it's a really broad question, but how. Do you think that everybody in the world has been influenced in some sort of fashion by religion? I mean, we know that the United States has been influenced by uh, uh, basically founded. Well, a lot of people say it's founded on Christianity. I tend to disagree. But uh, how do you think that this has religion has played out in, in the world as like a whole? Oh, it's been incredibly influential. It uh, completely changed the ancient world from their religions to a new set of Abrahamic religions that uh, reoriented society in many, many important ways. Um, it's fundamental to human nature, evidently, that people become religious, that a priest class forms, that the priest class gains dominance in society, mandates behavior, affects language, um, child rearing, it becomes a very important aspect of rearing our children. It gets uh, involved in the formation of the state and in our sense of moral and normal conduct. 
Uh, it relates to sexuality. It relates, uh, used to relate very heavily to agriculture and industry and how the uh, heavens were perceived, how the earth itself was perceived. And um, it became an anthropomorphic projection of what we are as human beings relative to other animals and living entities. And we then took that a step further and invented the mythology of the gods uh, that correlated very strongly to the family structure with a father and a mother and a son, <clears throat> son and daughter, or an androgynous son, um, in terms of even this, the field of genetics, alchemy, and the idea of creating homunculi from uh, DNA is very, uh, has been an ongoing project for 2,000 years based on the old alchemist's plan to create homunculi, little small people, in glass flasks from male seed, um, they didn't believe, the homunculus didn't believe that there was a female seed, and they thought that the womb was like primordial chaos, and that the seed of the male is like the uh, infinite light that gives order to that chaos, and they could therefore create life. So many of our scientific concepts, the concept of the Big Bang came from the uh, mythology of Phanes Protogenes and the cosmic egg. Uh, the, the Catholic who came up with the idea of the Big Bang uh, said that his theory was based upon that Orphic mythology. So in every aspect of our lives, religion has been very, very important. And what I am most concerned about is that aspect of the Abrahamic faith, which cause, calls for the destruction of humanity on the false premise that uh, destroying us because we are supposedly fundamentally evil is our salvation. And I think that has caused tremendous harm to society and that we are at the precipice of an event which may exterminate humanity. And that has been a plan for 2,500 years to exterminate humanity. And I want to alert people to this plan, uh, what it entails, how, how it has caused tremendous harm and how we can protect ourselves from it. Would you agree that the story of Adam in the Bible is a story of a, an androgynous figure and that maybe Adam and Eve was, uh, Adam was an androgynous and then uh, God or the angels came in and separated Eve from Adam and made two separate beings? I mean, obviously it's allegorical and metaphorical, but some people take these stories as being real legit stories and then when you correlate that to what they're trying to do right now in the mainstream with uh transgenderism making males females females males it seems like they're trying to push this androgynous thing and then when you go back and you you know you know reading the bible and trying to dissect it you realize that androgyny was a huge part of the bible Oh, absolutely. I agree uh, completely. That's one of the main themes of my book, Beware of the World to Come. Um, Adam and Eve were created in the image of the gods. Those gods were El and Asherah, the male and female aspect of God. All of this goes way back into Sumerian, Babylonian, and Akkadian mythology, as well as Greek mythology. Phanes Protogenes was an androgynous god who had a male aspect and a female aspect. Um, this relates to the metaphysical concept that the universe is composed of primordial chaos, which is then given order by reason and by light. Reason and light are the male aspect of the gods. Primordial chaos is the womb and the female aspect of the gods. Uh, Genesis says that um, Adam was created in the image of the Elohim, which means the gods, male and female. So he had both a male and a female aspect. The Kabbalists go on to explain that he was originally composed of the light of order and did not have a body. His body came when he was separated into Adam and Eve. Eve is the womb of chaos that allows for procreation. Adam, as an androgynous being, was immortal and had no need of procreation. 
So when the gods separated Adam into Adam and Eve, his male and his female aspect, they were breaking the balance of the universe, which was originally a divine mixture of cosmic light and primordial chaos given order and ideal forms by that cosmic light. The mythology asserts that the ideal form of humanity ought to be androgynous so that there is a balance of these two forces and that the original God um, known to the Greeks as the monad uh, in Kabbalah, it is the Ein, the nothingness even above the, the monad um, before God, God's unity was broken. Uh, God had both the aspect of light and darkness and uh, darkness itself was a more brilliant form of light than the light of daylight. And so this was a catastrophe that occurred at the beginning of creation. And the catastrophe was the separation of Adam into Adam and Eve, male and female. And that catastrophe has to be rectified by the reunification of the male aspect of Adam and the female aspect of Eve into one being, which is the driving force behind all of this uh, androgyny agenda that we see in the mass media with the Noahide uh, rainbow flag, which is a Kabbalistic image. And the Christian Kabbalists, as well as the Jewish Kabbalists, have been saying for centuries that at the end of the 6,000 years of creation, um, the world will be rectified, the divine sparks will be released from the husks of the Kelipot, and humanity will return to its original immortal androgynous state as Adam. And all of that is spelled out in the Gnostic texts. It was then uh, pointed out in the Midrash and the Talmudic texts. And then the Kabbalists picked up on the same theme, the Jewish Kabbalists, uh, the Spanish Kabbalists of the 1200s. And then through um, uh, Pico Mirandola, it became a Christian Kabbalist tenet that humanity has to become again androgynous. Isn't that what the Trinity is actually supposed to represent? I don't think we talked really talked about this too much last time. That you know about the the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't the Trinity supposed to represent male and female coming together and then creating God? Or am I off base with that? No, absolutely. The Trinity is based upon that concept of the Father is the male aspect, Yahweh. The Holy Spirit is the female aspect, originally called Asherah, now called Shekinah. They are the parents. They are modeled after the Greek parents, Kronos and Ananka. Kronos and Ananka produce the androgynous son of light, who was called Phanes Protogenes in the Orphic mystery religions that was picked up by Judaism to be the androgynous son uh, called by the pre-Gnostics and the early Gnostics, Adam of light. That became Adam Kadmon in Kabbalah. It became Jesus Christ in Christianity. Phanes protogenous means light bringer first begotten. And that is what Jesus Christ was called in the Gnostic gospel of John in the Bible. And um, most of the Gnostic texts refer to Jesus as a being of light and as a second coming of Adam. And Jesus himself in the Gnostic texts had the male aspect of Gnosis and the female aspect of wisdom, who was called his female aspect, Sophia. So we have uh, the two um, God, the Godhead divided into its male aspect, the father, its female aspect, the mother giving birth to an androgynous son, which is then separated itself into its male and female aspects of light and darkness so that there can be procreation. The light becomes the seed, the darkness becomes the womb, the seed and the womb allow human beings to procreate. Procreation is necessary because creation was flawed from the beginning. It is contingent upon humanity to rectify that flawed creation and they must perfect themselves uh, in what is called in Judaism, Gilgul, which is reincarnation. And each successive generation 
uh, becomes more purified through this process of reincarnation that will ultimately produce 600,000 immortal androgynous uh, androgynes after the fruit of the tree of knowledge has ripened and knowledge has successfully enabled humanity to create the homunculi and glass flasks exclusively from male seed that will then produce uh, 600,000 immortal androgynes. That has been the plan for 2,500 years. It was supposed to come to fruition at the year 6,000, which according to the Anno Lucas calendar, which the Shabbatians and Freemasons follow, was the year 2000 AD. According to the Hebrew calendar, it, it will be the year 2240 AD. But uh, the sooner it happens, the better. The sooner that humanity is able to reunite male and female into one, obtain the balance of yin and yang, and uh, the combination of light and darkness so that the darkness shines and illuminates, um, it will then uh, produce perfection. And in the mythologies of Kabbalah, it states that the moon was originally uh, self-luminating and that the darkness of the moon was infinitely brighter than the uh, light of the sun. So the female aspect of darkness is really the most uh, productive and that the female has to become dominant at the end of the 6,000 years. So uh, males have to become more female and females have to become more masculine in the world of Malkut. If people are familiar with the Sephirotic tree of life, at the very bottom, you have Melkut. Originally, there was a different Sephirotic tree of life that had Da'at, which is knowledge. And um, the catastrophes of the fall of Adam, etc., broke that apart. And then a new world was created at the base of the tree of life as the final emanation of the tree of life as Melkut, which is the earth on which we live it is dominated by the female aspect of God, the darkness of the womb, who is Shekinah. And then below all of that is the evil world of the Kalapotic tree of life, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is called in the Zohar, the tree of death. And that will relate to the Armenian genocide when we get into that. So we talked about the Trinity, right? And that being, uh, you just explained that perfectly. Yes, so and the, it's important to understand for Christians, as well as uh, all the Abrahamic faiths, for everyone, <laughs> is that the Holy Spirit is the female aspect of God, who was originally called Asherah and uh, is now called by the Kabbalist Shekinah. And that mythology of Shekinah is permeating into Christian evangelicals. We hear Reverend Hagee discussing uh, Shekinah. Then when you look at the Merkaba, which is the um, the Jewish star, that would be two of these trinities on just two trinity symbols, basically the, the triangles just connected to each other. And one is would be the would technically be Eve, and the other one would be Adam, right? And then that gets into they're discussing the star of David. Merkaba yes. represents chariot. It is a reference to the first chapter of Ezekiel, uh, the chariot restoring the soul to the God, to God. Um, one of the, the concepts that came out of Plato and out of the Greeks is that God is a unity. And from Parmenides, it was called the monad, meaning the one. In the Bible, we have the Shema in Deuteronomy, which refers to the Holy One, that God is one. The Muslims say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but God. Muhammad is the prophet of God. This is all referring to the unity of God. In order for God to create the universe, God, uh, according to the Kabbalists, contracted itself to create a space separate from itself so that it could allow for differentiation and distance from itself without breaking its own unity. Satan is the master of that separation from unity. Satan is the divider who creates distance and separation from God. And that differentiation is necessary for individual souls to exist. The concept of Merkabah comes from Platonism and later Neoplatonism. 
the idea that our souls were emanated from a world soul, which is in the upper trinity, which you're discussing, which is across the abyss, which is in the what Plato called the divine realm across the great divide. This goes way back into the Mithraic religions, uh, picked up later by the Muslims, where there are are seven planets and the soul uh, descended down those seven planets and became increasingly corrupted and evil because the distance from the soul to God, which is across the great divide in the heavens beyond the stars and the seven planets became greater and the separation from God became greater and more satanic and Satan rules the earth. So the concept of Merkava is to get into your chariot hop over those seven planets back to God, give up your own ego. Uh, it's the destruction of the ego, destruction of the self, to reunite with God and become a righteous prophet, a tzaddikim, uh, one of the righteous who is now reunited with God, and that unity becomes perfection. And the cycle of creation, the separation from God, the emanation from God is repaired by the epistrophe back to God, climbing that pyramid, back to God who initially emanated our souls through the world soul, which in Kabbalah is called the guff, or Adam Kadmon is also considered the world soul. There's a different branch. That's the right-hand path. The right-hand path is to try to reunite your soul with the Holy One and repair the unity and uh, diminish the distance from God, the separation from God, which is called, caused by the evil side, which is Satan. The other path is the path of the soul to dive down into the Kelipot, the Sitra Akra, the other side, the tree of knowledge, and descend through that Kelipotic tree down into the earth, deeper into Deat, towards Satan in the center of hell. And the goal of that is to create absolute separation from God and absolute individuality. Just but also through around. that, also through that, don't mean to cut you off, uh, Christopher, but I've heard that the left-hand path people believe that if they go so far down and separate so far away from God that they can literally pop out the other side. Right? That they can go so deep down the left-hand path that they'll wrap right back around and be at the top of the right-hand path. Is that something that uh, you've it's, heard as well? It's, it's more like turning an hourglass over. The top tree, the Sephirotic tree is above right now, which is wrong. It shouldn't be that way because chaos was the original highest world of the Ein, which is nothingness. And the, the uh, Kelipotic tree in a catastrophe, is buried in the earth, in the dung heap of the earth. And the goal is to reverse those two trees, like turning over an hourglass. As the cycle of creation rotates, the one tree ascends above the other one. But the goal of the left-hand path is not to reunite with God. It is to become your own God and master of chaos, so that your will as a magician enables you to give order through your intellect and your light, the light of your soul, which becomes the shining darkness, to chaos, and you can create your own life. And that is the goal of the ripening of knowledge, is to attain the knowledge of how to convert human beings from male seed into immortal androgynes. The goal of the Kabbalist on the left-hand path is not that goal of reunification through the Merkaba. It is the polar, literally the polar opposite of diving deeper into hell in order to become a God yourself. And the earthly Torah uh, will be scrubbed at that point and Yahweh himself will be killed through the disbelief of the Kabbalists and the Kabbalists will replace all the gods just as Satan wanted a world of his own. The Kabbalists want a world of their own where their souls become gods, become androgynous, immortal gods that can create life and impose their divine will on chaos as magicians to uh, form chaos into whatever it is that their will wants. Now, in terms of the two triangles you discussed, 
The triangle pointed upwards is the phallus. The triangle pointed downwards is the womb. It represents the principle as above, so below. As, a, as it is in heaven, it will be on earth. And that's an old Egyptian concept, that there is a mirror, mirror world to the earth in heaven. Uh, in terms of Judaism, it relates to the idea that there is a, a, um, a heavenly throne in Tiferet that Yahweh sits upon. And the idea is to raise Malkut to Tiferet through Yassad, which is uh, Yahweh's phallus so that the two are combined, and as Jesus said, so that it will be on earth as it is in heaven. The Christians believe that that will happen by sacrificing themselves, killing themselves off, which I believe was a subversive trap that was set for them. The Kabbalists believe that that will happen by rectifying the universe and obeying the 613 mitzvot of the Torah, so that the law is fulfilled. The earthly Torah, is garbage. It was created out of the tree of knowledge. The heavenly Torah was created out of the tree of life, and that's the pure Torah of the world to come. So the idea of, uh, especially the Shabbatayan Kabbalists, is to abandon the earthly Torah of Yahweh, to abandon Yahweh, to gain the freedom of chaos over the restrictive order of Yahweh's earthly law, that was created by the tree of knowledge and instead pursue Kabbalah, which is the heavenly Torah created out of the tree of life, and then to obtain the tree of life. And what happens is the two trees reverse themselves. The tree of death becomes the tree of life when the fruit ripens and uh, the Kabbalists gain supremacy over chaos and become gods themselves. And that is how it is making as above, so below. It is a reversal of the two trees so that the Kalipotic tree of death becomes the tree of life and becomes the shining darkness, which is infinitely more brilliant than the sunlight of the uh, sun. And the Kabbalists worship the moon. They think it is tragic that the moon has become a reflection of the light of day. The moon can be seen both day and night. So what they're trying to do is in the night, uh, your, the nighttime in your dreams are that Kelipotic world. So they want to enter the Kelipotic world, rescue it, and rectify it. Yeah, I had them backwards. I had Eve's as the one that was up and uh, Adam's as the one that's down. But thanks for clarifying that. So what about the 144,000 that everybody always refers to in the Bible? They're like, oh, yeah, the rapture is going to come, 144,000. Uh, people are going to be raptured up in the heaven at the, the end of times. What does that actually mean? That comes from the book of Revelation. Uh, it was long understood to mean that it would be 144,000 Jewish males who would be the remnant of the Jews um, and that they would uh, repopulate the kingdom of the Jews. And there are many uh, other mythologies which had built up around it, but that was probably the primary initial meaning. Um, Christianity was established to play the roles of Satan, and one of the primary roles of Satan is to be the tempter. The tempter tempts uh, Jews to worship Satan as if God, which is idolatry, those Jews who do become apostates, they will be punished in the end. And uh, if their souls can be rectified by three reincarnations um, or thousands of reincarnations, depending on the severity of their sins, they will then be permitted to enter the world to come. If uh, not, then they will be utterly destroyed and nullified. They will have absolute distance from God, be separated by Satan into the infinite, infinitesimal particles of chaos and disappear into nothingness. So it can be looked at from two different perspectives. It can be looked at from the perspective of uh, Revelation, the Revelation of John of Patmos, or it can be looked at from the Kabbalistic perspective. But the number of 144,000 is a Christian idea. The um, Kabbalists believe in 600,000 souls. 600,000 was the number of Jewish males who slept 
enslaved in Egypt and who left with Moses to take uh, the promised land. So they believe that there are 600,000 souls which were initially incorporated into Adam Ahelion, Adam, the supreme man, and that those 600,000 souls will be the only souls allowed to enter the future world to come, Olam Haba, when the present world, Olam Hazeh, ends at the end of the 6,000 6, year cycle. And if they can do it by ripening the tree of knowledge, to utilize that to create these 600,000 immortal androgynes in laboratories. Those laboratories are now being constructed. It was a big story in the news that they are creating a lab which can produce uh, 30 or 40,000 uh, infants in uh, lab conditions. Uh, in Israel, they are working on the technology to convert male skin cells into egg cells so that a male being, uh, preferably the Messiah himself, Messiah, son of David, will be able to utilize his seed and his skin cells to create 600,000 immortal androgynes in laboratories uh, from his own genetics. Which is all built upon a lie because and oh, we got to be careful. <laughs> we got to be careful, uh, you know, how we're going to phrase this. But there are no God's chosen people. Right, that's a that's a fake. There made are no up. gods, so it would be difficult for there to be God's chosen people. What there are are human beings. We're still alive. We still have the ability to stop all of this. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, so that we can expose this and get people talking about it, to realize yeah. what's behind it, so that we don't just go along with it. One of the things that they do is they appeal to our humanitarian altruism, and they make it. Uh, seem as if they are doing these things for the benefit of humanity, which uh, they phrase as tikkun olam, rectification of the world. In fact, what they're doing is to fulfill these plans to create 600,000 immortal androgynes and exclude all other human beings, which is genocidal. It's atrocious. It is trying to change the human nature to match an ancient mythology of beings which never existed. And um, if they succeed, and they are, it'll be the end of us. And all our future children, all our progeny, all our generations will be lost, which is the plan. Which then also coincides with, you know, what they've been talking about, that they want to eliminate up to 80% of the population. Right. And kill off majority of the population. And if you're, you know, correct in saying that they want to, which I think that you are, create these androgyne, um, this population, if they wipe out a majority of the population and then these are what's left, the only thing that's left on the earth, then it is a huge problem. Right. Oh, They've, of course. It's uh, <laughs> life or death for all of us and for uh, the human being. It's the elimination of the human being to utilize the ripened fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to replace us with what they believe Adam was initially. And the goal is to create complete separation from the God Yahweh, uh, just as Satan wanted to do to create a kingdom of their own on the earth, which they refer to as the world to come. And from this kingdom to produce 600,000 gods, individual gods, who will then have tremendous power through their will, through science and technology, the ripened fruit of the tree of knowledge, to do whatever it is they want, to take over the stars, to start molding chaos in whatever forms they want, to become masters of the planets, to utilize their consciousness as a divine force to impose itself on chaos and reshape uh, the universe into whatever it is they want. It's an ultimate form of solipsism. It's antimoniumism that gets rid of the Torah, the earthly Torah, and substitutes in its place Kabbalah, which um, plans for all these things which I'm discussing. And it has its roots deep in uh, Greek mystery religions, in uh, Sumerian, Akkadian, uh, Babylonian religions, in um, Zoroastrianism, in um, Many of the ancient Egyptian, I think, was probably the primary uh, thing that they drew from 
that uh, established all of these horrific, to me, horrific mythologies of the destruction of humankind and its replacement by uh, androgyne kind. Do you think that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge was some sort of technology or was it an actual tree? I think what it represented was the concept of ascent and descent. Um, in the um, ancient Sumerian and Akkadian myths, as Simo Parpola uh, demonstrated and argued, that um, there was this concept of this tree. At the head of the tree was an eagle representing the ascent of the soul back up to the gods across the seven planets uh, through the great divide of the stars to God. And that represented the ascent to unity with God. The, at the base of the tree was the serpent. And the serpent represented chaos, separation from God and individuality. And that... Uh, an adept uh, called a Hasid in um, Kabbalah. Uh, to the Sumerians, it was someone who wanted to become a priest or to have their soul either become its own god by descending to the serpent as Satan descended to gain his own kingdom and become his own god and leave the throne of God, or to ascend as the eagle to God to regain unity with God, which emanated humanity. And in those myths, the gods were terrible. They wanted to destroy humanity because they viewed humanity as noisy and disturbing. They had only created humanity to serve as slaves, to provide them with the energy that they could consume by uh, destroying humanity and consuming our energy. The Egyptians had a similar mythology with Shesmu and Unas, where the gods would kill us and drink our blood as wine to gain the magic powers of us and our individual gods that they could uh, feast upon to make, make themselves more powerful. So it is uh, not surprising that all of these things call for the destruction of humanity uh, for the evil purpose of making the gods stronger and uh, utilizing us as food for the gods. And people should realize that these mythologies delve thousands of years back into those mythologies. And we are in grave danger because that is the aim. The aim is to destroy humanity so that our individual souls can be consumed and then uh, transferred into the vessel of the body of these 600,000 immortal androgynes. They view themselves as the second born. The light is the second born to primordial chaos. Chaos come, is the darkness before the light. They view themselves as that light and they need to steal the higher soul, the tohu, vavohu, choshech, the uh, formlessness, emptiness, and darkness of the ein, the ultimate nothingness. It's not nothingness because it doesn't exist. It's nothingness because it's ineffable. The human mind cannot conceive of it. So by nothingness is what they mean that it is beyond us. And that the firstborn have that soul of the nothingness because they were created first. And that soul has to be freed up by killing off the firstborn, which is what the uh, Phoenicians and the ancient Canaanites and the ancient Jews used to do by feeding their firstborn children into the oven of Moloch, was to free up their souls so that then the secondborn could place that higher soul into themselves as the vessel. And that would then obtain that balance that they want of unifying Adam and Eve back into an androgyne. The androgyne is a symbol of that balance of light and darkness combining, chaos and order combining into a pure form that is balanced. Where does Moloch come from? Because people has a they have like a skewed idea of what Moloch is like he's normally presented as like an owl figure but he's not really an owl figure he's a bull the, bull the owl figure. figure is Minerva initially in uh, Greek mythology that becomes in Isaiah chapter 34 the screech owl of the night 
um, owls are night creatures. The night is related to the moon. The moon has a 30 day cycle. The perfect year is 360 days, 12 cycles of those 30 lunar day uh, cycles. The moon correlates to wisdom. Minerva was the goddess of wisdom. The womb of chaos is wisdom. The Trinity is uh, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. You need all three of those to complete the trinity of the father, the mother, and the androgynous son. So that is where uh, the owl comes from. Moloch is represented as a gigantic bronze bull, which is an oven. It has seven chambers to represent the seven planets and the ascent of the soul across those seven planets to a reunion with God. The idea is to take the firstborn who are chaos, return the firstborn to God as an offering so that that soul is then freed up and can be assimilated by the vessel, the body of the secondborn, and create that bot balance of order. And all of these people in these original societies were secondborn children because their parents had murdered all of the firstborn. So there is this intrinsic hatred of the firstborn. The firstborn became associated with the Egyptians because the Egyptians had the Ben-Ben, the mound of chaos from which the universe was created. You have the biblical story of the slaughter of the firstborn. So it is all correlated to that idea of destroying chaos, mastering chaos, and imposing the will of order of the secondborn who bear the divine intellect and the light of seed upon chaos. So the firstborn become the slaves, the firstborn become the official sacrifices. And within the Judahite society, that murder of their own firstborn became replaced by the murder of the outsiders and their firstborn were redeemed with silver. As Jesus was sold off for 30 pieces of silver, they give five temple shekels to redeem their own firstborn children so that uh, they are redeemed. And ultimately, the goal is to eliminate the firstborn, firstborn being non-Israelites, and assimilate that soul into themselves as the vessel. Ultimately, it is configured as the death of Messiah, son of Joseph, who represents the firstborn, represents the devil, uh, represents the uh, Messiah anointed for war. He must die and give up his soul as Jesus died and gave up his soul. That soul then enters Messiah, son of David, who contains all 600,000 souls as the Adam, as the Adam Kadmon as uh, Metatron, and he will be the guff, the well of souls for the 600,000 immortal androgynes to be produced as soon as possible. What kind of loving, caring God that people believe in requires some kind of blood sacrifice? It doesn't sound like a loving and a caring God to me. They right? never viewed Yahweh as a loving, caring God. <laughs> they always viewed Yahweh as a caco demon who iterates curses against humanity. The Old Testament is a series of genocidal curses upon humanity. And that is how the Armenian genocide came to be. Um, those curses are iterated in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 to 19, and Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 to 16, as the extermination of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the first nation to wage war against Israel. Joshua, Jesus is Joshua, waged a war of extermination on the Amalekites. Those passages I just referenced call for the complete extermination of the Amalekites. Those are the Kako demon Yahweh's curses on humanity. And if the Israelites fail to obey those commandments, which become three of the 613 mitzvot, uh, the 613 commandments, then Yahweh will instead impose his wrath and his anger on the Israelites and exterminate them. So the mythology creates a scenario where they are either obliged to commit genocide 
were obliged to have genocide committed against them. So if you read the Old Testament, the Israelites always hated Yahweh. They were always in search of foreign, benevolent, loving gods, as you described, as opposed to Yahweh. But whenever they did that, Yahweh would uh, chase them out of the Holy Land and would commit terrible acts of slaughter against them, just as Moses committed terrible acts of slaughter when they worshipped the golden calf who was to be that loving, benevolent God who celebrated the joy of life instead of Yahweh who celebrates wrath and slaughter. So the Israelites were always aware that they were worshiping an evil God, but they believed that they had to worship him and offer him sacrifices so that he would do them no harm. And that is what the Greeks referred to as a cacodemon. And the Romans had a very similar God that they called Vejovus, who was opposed to the god Jove. Jove was the loving god, but they worshipped both sides, which is what uh, Judaism is. It's the worship of both sides. You give the evil side sacrifices so that it does you no harm, but instead joins with you in destroying your enemies. And the gods of Judaism are cacodemons. And it was commonplace in the ancient world for there to be cacodemons. The Persians had the god Armanius, who appears as a lion-headed god with a serpent wrapped around it. That was the cacodemon of the Mithraic religion. But both sides have to be appeased. Both sides have to be offered their sacrifices. And if you do that, they will leave you alone and instead help you to destroy your enemies. And the Romans would offer up black sheep as well as white sheep as sacrifices so that both the evil misanthropic gods as well as the loving glorious gods of light would benefit them and destroy their enemies. And they had no shame in that and they did not view that as dangerous to their souls, nor do the Kabbalists. So the Kabbalists worship both sides, give both sides uh, sacrifices, and they believe that that will have the gods leave them alone until the point where they gain enough knowledge to supplant the gods, to kill off the gods and become gods themselves. And that was the purpose of most of the uh, ancient religions of the Mediterranean and of the Middle East, was ultimately to become so great that you could take over the gods. Just as Zeus took over Kronos, Kronos took over Uranus, the ultimate aim of the Atlanteans and Prometheus was to make mankind elevated through knowledge to the point where that knowledge would enable man to become that master of chaos. Man could then ascend Mount Olympus and destroy Zeus. That became the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, where mankind would utilize its knowledge to ascend the Tower of Babel, slay the gods with hatchets, and take their place. And that they have uh, destroyed all of those beliefs among the Europeans and other countries, but they've maintained them for themselves. So their ultimate object is to be like the Atlanteans, to gain enough knowledge to uh, come to the point where they become self-procreative, not through their bodies, but through their knowledge, and to uh, kill off the gods and replace them as 600,000 immortal androgynous gods. I think you just explained my question that I'm about to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think it's important to, to clarify. So there is no God's chosen people because there is no gods, right? So then and we have to be careful here. What does Israel mean then? Is it any way, shape or form important? Is it, or have they completely made it up and they've made, completely made up the entire holy land and uh, and all of that there's a extremely complex history to all of that and it depends on what you want to believe and what period of history you're discussing in the torah it states uh, that the judahites were never the original people of the palestinian region they instead descended from Abraham, who came from Ur, they ended up um, through Jacob in, um, through Joseph in uh, Egypt. They spent 400 some odd years in Egypt. Then they were given, uh, the promise was given to Abraham that if he was obedient to the God Yahweh, 
Uh, he would be given the Holy Land. The evil people of the Holy Land were vomited out for sacrificing their firstborn, among other sins. And that land would be transferred to uh, the children of Jacob, Israel. Um, the reality, as scholars are increasingly finding, is that there were northern tribes that lived in uh, Palestine. There weren't too many southern peoples. Uh, the whole mythology was fabricated. It's been proven that it was fabricated sometime around the time that the Septuagint was written in the 270s BC because the elephantine papyri found in Egypt, which date from the 5th century BC, contain none of this mythology, but was written by Jewish people in that area at that time. They did not have the name Moses. They had no story of the Exodus. It was all completely fabricated. So the Judeans were simply the Canaanites that they condemned. Um, they came up with a kind of replacement theology of their own, where they would stop sacrificing their own firstborn and instead sacrifice the, the Egyptians as the firstborn and the Canaanites as the firstborn and whoever was hostile to them or whoever they wanted to defeat, they would sacrifice them instead of sacrificing their own firstborn children. Um, the interesting thing is that the Torah that was composed in the Septuagint of the 270s BC planned for the diaspora and insisted upon it because that evil cacodemon Yahweh's punishment against the Jewish people for disobedience was to destroy his own temple and to scatter them. So they were blamed for the fact that the Greeks under Antiochus Epiphanes uh, IV had uh, infiltrated the temple, sacrificed pigs in it, that Caligula would later do the same or attempt to do the same for the Romans, but what they really did was create all this mythology hundreds of years before, and then they themselves destroyed the temple in 70 AD under Tiberius Julius Alexander, who was a crypto Jew who uh, worked with the family of Philo Judeus, the famous Platonic philosopher, which was the wealthiest family in the world. Uh, Philo's brother was the wealthiest man in the world. They themselves fulfilled all of these plans, which were established in Deuteronomy and in the Torah, hundreds of years before the Jews were sent into the diaspora by their own people. The purpose of that was so that they could then enter at all four corners of the world, take over those governments and create a world government of their own. So it served a purpose. The diaspora served a purpose of infiltration. They planned that after the fulfillment of an age, which is a 2000 year period, the age of Pisces, Jesus representing the fish of Pisces, that they would utilize Christianity to create a world empire that would eliminate all of the other gods. Uh, Jesus is the god Shesmu who slays all the other gods. So they created Jesus as the wine press treading god of the Egyptian god Shesmu who would extract the blood of all the other gods, feed that blood to Unas, who is Yahweh, who would then gain all of that magical power as above, so below, as Yahweh became more powerful, uh, the tribe would become more powerful and supplant the Christians at the end of the cycle. Jesus flips, as Satan does on Yom Kippur, for the gift of a scapegoat and becomes the advocate instead of being the prosecutor and the heavenly court, he becomes the advocate of Israel in exchange for the scapegoat and becomes the Antichrist. So the Christ returns as the Antichrist and slays all the Christians. All of this was written down in the Gospel of Judas and Apocalypse of Abraham. Uh, Apocalypse of Abraham was written at the same time as uh, the Gospel of Mark, which became the foundational gospel for Matthew, Luke, and John. So this was obviously the original plan. And uh, Book of Revelations makes it clear that Jesus returns as this wine press, wine press treading God who was described in Isaiah chapter 63, and he will trample on all the Christians and kill them off. The Christ is the Antichrist. And the Kabbalists say exactly that. 
that Jesus is Satan, Jesus is the Messiah, son of Joseph, the Christ returns as the Antichrist and as the advocate because he is given the scapegoat of the Christians, which cause him to flip. And I have the Zoharic passages which describe that. Yes. Um, Screen if you'd share. like to see, maybe I can share my screen and show that to you. Absolutely. Let me see. I got to find my scapegoat. There you are. <laughs> so let me see if I can remember how to do this. Should just be at the bottom. Hit uh, share screen. You should have the, yeah, there we go. I can see it. So the, um, the Zohar made clear in Vayikra section 3, folio 62b to 63a, that uh, when the he-goat, which there are two goats uh, that were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. One goat was sent out into the wilderness to Satan to be given to him to confuse him so that he flips from being the prosecutor of Israel in the heavenly court to being their advocate. And um, the Zohar states when that he goat reaches the rock of Azazel, Azazel is Satan, uh, also referred to by Kabbalists as Samael. There is great rejoicing and the emissary who went forth to accuse returns and declares the praises of Israel. Israel's, uh, the Judahites were terrible sinners. They were always cursing Yahweh because he had always cursed them. They needed a scapegoat to take on those sins so that uh, the Lord would give them mercy and so that Samael would accuse um, the nations instead of accusing Israel of what Israel had done. And that's where the term scapegoat comes from. And it continues the praises of Israel, the accuser becoming the defender. Uh, Israel the still does this, uh, this ritual, right? They still no, do this since ritual? the temple was destroyed, they had to eliminate animal sacrifices. So instead of destroying animals, they destroy human beings. And the Armenians became this scapegoat. And the Armenians were referred to as the Amalekites. They, a million and a half of them uh, uh, were destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of them were sent into the Syrian desert to mimic this practice of sending the goat into the wilderness. The wilderness is the mansion of Satan. So the Armenians were sent into the wilderness of Satan as the Amalekites to be exterminated according to what it expressly states in Deuteronomy and Exodus. We can read that after this, but let's uh, stick with Yom Kippur for a moment, if we may. Yes. So what happens on the Day of Atonement is there is a trial held in heaven. And in that trial, Satan, who is the tempter, had witnessed all of the sins that he, he had tempted. And he can then accuse. He becomes the accuser. The accuser stands at the right hand of God, accuses Israel of all its sins. It's really only Israel who can sin because only Israel is subject to the law. So they need a scapegoat to take on those sins so that they can then obtain the mercy of God. So they send this scapegoat out into the desert. They push it off a cliff. It has a red ribbon tied around its head. There's a red ribbon tied around the gate of the sanctuary. When the scapegoat tumbles down the cliff, it is ripped to pieces. Satan absorbs it. The red ribbon turns white because of a passage in Isaiah that says the sins are cleansed and changed from blood to snow. At the same time, the high priest would witness the red ribbon that was tied on the gate of the sanctuary, and it would turn white. And then they would know that Satan, who is the prosecutor, he is the guardian angel of uh, non-Israelites. He is their prince, and he is supposed to be their defender in the heavenly court, then flips and becomes the guardian angel and defender of Israel. Not the guardian angel. Yahweh is the guardian angel of Israel. But it's he becomes awful. their defender in the court and falsely accuses uh, all the nations of what the Israelites had done. It's pretty suspicious, uh, Christopher, that this red ribbon on this goat looks a lot like a crown of thorns, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
And the whole Christian mythology is based on the idea that Jesus is this scapegoat. And there was something called the ransom theory of atonement, which was created by the uh, Christian fathers, uh, Origen being the primary one that lasted for a thousand years, which said exactly that, that Jesus was sacrificed to Satan. That was standard Christian dogma for a thousand years. So the Zohar um, validates all of this, says that uh, Satan flips, becomes the defender instead of the accuser. And then in uh, further on in folio 102a, it states, said Rabbi Yosa, woe to the people of Esau, Esau being uh, the nations as opposed to the Israelites. At that time when Israel send that he go to the informer who is their chieftain, Satan is the father of all the Gentiles. He uh, slept with Eve to produce Cain. Cain's progeny are uh, the non-Israelites. He is their guardian angel. So uh, it says that informer who is that their chieftain, in other words, Satan, who is their father, since for its sake, he comes and praises Israel and God diverts all those sins onto the head of his people. His people are the non-Israelites. So that is where the concept of the scapegoat comes from. Though they claim that they are always scapegoated for the sins of other people, it is in fact their religious ritual to scapegoat uh, the nations for their own sins. And that's exactly what happened to uh, the Armenian people. If I can pull up those passages. Yes, see them. Can you now see it where it says Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25, 17 through 19? Yes. Okay. So it says, remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, etc., etc., that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Now, the Armenians were called for at least a thousand years at least since the Chronicles of Yosepan, uh, meaning Joseph, they ascribe this book to um, Josephus, Flavius, Joseph, Josephus Flavius. They refer to the Armenians as these Amalekites who have to be blotted out of remembrance. And it is a commandment that they have to be completely exterminated. And I can show you that from the universal Jewish Encyclopedia, where it states that since Armenians are considered descendants of the Amalekites, they are called among them of the Orient also Timhe, meaning thou shalt blot out, referring to Deuteronomy 2519, referring to the Amalekites. So they equated the Armenians to the Amalekites. And whenever they would refer to Armenians, they would refer to exterminating them. So it is no coincidence at all that uh, these people in the Ottoman Empire who perpetrated the genocide of the Armenians were pursuing this religious commandment to exterminate the Armenian Amalekites. And there's even more to it than that. They uh -huh. had... Who really quick? Who is Josephus Flavius? I've heard his. He's name a most famous times. Jewish historian, shortly mm -hmm. after the time of Christ, who documented. Um, he worked for the Romans. He was uh, tied in with the Romans, and his goal was to glorify the Romans, but at the same time appeal to uh, Judaeus and incorporate all of that mythology into one set of mythology which would establish that the roman emperor was effectively the messiah basically writing the bible correct um i don't think he wrote the bible the septuagint was extant at that time ah. what he did was create an often fabricated history of ah. the jewish people okay. uh, which became standardized but then there was a christian man named Eusebi eusebius who corrupted what Josephus had created to insert passages which allege that Josephus had referred to Jesus Christ when he had not. Uh, but that, that's going way off on a different tangent. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to clear that up because I, I had heard that Josephus Flavius 
had a, had a hand in, uh, you know, putting all of these mythologies and, and all of these things together into one type of thing. And I had heard that maybe possibly that he had had a hand in creating some of the Bible, but thanks for clearing that up. Um, there was a man named Philo Judeus, uh, Philo the Jew of Alexandria, who combined the philosophy of Plato with Judaism. And uh, it was easy to do because the Torah itself was composed out of the mystery Orphic religions of the the Greeks, which became the basis of Platonic philosophy. Mm -hmm. And he introduced the idea of the logos from Platonic philosophy into Judaism, which had already appeared in the book of Isaiah mm -hmm. as the word and the word became God. And he had this logos figure who was the mediator, um, very similar to the demiurge of Platonic philosophy that would mediate between the Holy one, the monad and humanity. And that formed the basis for Christianity of this concept of Jesus as the word, as the logos. So it was essentially Philo who created the Platonic philosophy that became Christianity. And that might be what you're referencing much more so than Josephus. Thank you. Thanks for clearing it up. Um, can you see uh, Sanhedrin folio 20b? Yes. So there were three commandments established by the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud written between 250 and 500 AD that um, what we would today call Zionists would have to do in order to take the land of Palestine and uh, bring in the diaspora so that uh, the Jews could return to Palestine as was promised. And one of those things was to anoint their king and establish their king. Another one of those things was to rebuild uh, the second temple of Solomon as the third temple. And the other one was to exterminate those pesky Amalekites. The first thing that they had to do to return to Palestine was to exterminate the seed of the Amalekites. As I proved to you, they referred to the Armenians as the Amalekites. The people who exterminated the Armenians were Zionists. So what they were doing was fulfilling these three commandments in the order in which they had to be fulfilled. So what we now see is after the Armenian genocide, they were able to take over Palestine and they are now going to anoint their king and rebuild their temple. And that is why we had uh, these progression of events that took place in the Armenian genocide. And the Armenian genocide was perpetrated by a group called the Dern May, who lived in the Ottoman Empire and started to call themselves Young Turks. And they met in Freemasonic lodges in Salonika, Greece, which was then a part of the Ottoman Empire. And they overthrew the Ottoman Empire but they concealed the fact of their true religious beliefs, just as their forefather, Shabbatai Tsevi, had done. Shabbatai Tsevi in uh, 1666 asserted that he was the Messiah, son of David, that he would go into the prison of the nations, rescue Messiah, son of Joseph, who is Jesus Christ, from that prison, absorb his soul, and become that king who would be anointed in Palestine. But first, the Amalekites had to be killed. So his descendants, the Dernme of the Ottoman Empire, exterminated uh, essentially the Armenian people in order to fulfill the first of those three commandments. And they are now setting about to rebuild the temple so that they can uh, then anoint the um, heir to the throne of Shabbatai Tsevi. Once again, they believe in reincarnation, and they believe that Shabbatai Tsevi's soul has been reincarnated in every generation since his death. It was reincarnated as Osman Baba, who founded the Derme. The Derme primarily set up in Salonika. There were 20,000 of them. There were also 80,000 Sephardic Jews who had emigrated from Spain when the Jews were persecuted in Spain and Judaism was banned by Isabella and Ferdinand in 1492. 
They came over. Most of them settled in Salonika, Greece. They produced uh, Shabbatai. Well, they didn't produce him, but he centered himself in Salonika for a long time, and that produced his successor, Asman Bey, who created the Dernme. Another one of the reincarnations of his soul was Bayuhura Russo, who was a very important figure that's almost never discussed. I'm pretty much the only person in the world who ever talks about him publicly. Bayuhira Russo's soul was reincarnated as Jacob Frank. Jacob Frank became the head of the Frankists. Jacob Frank spoke very negatively of the Armenian people, and uh, he established the plans to exterminate the Armenians as the Amalekites to fulfill the first of those three requirements in order for the throne of Shabbatai Tsevi's soul to be established in Jerusalem. So they got Palestine, they've got Jerusalem. All they need to do now is um, finish exterminating the Amalekites, which becomes every other nation on earth, and to rebuild their temple and anoint their king in the newly established rebuilt temple. And who who is that king? That's the big question. That's the question on everybody's lips. Um, some of them think it was Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who was the seventh Rebbe of the uh, sect of Chabad Lubavitch, which was established by Snor Salman of Liadi. He said that there would be seven, and then the Messiah son of David would appear. Um, there's a split among Chabad Lubavitch, who believed that it was Menachem Mendel Schneerson. I think he died in 96. And that his soul will be reincarnated in someone they have set up to do it. They have set up all the priestly utensils. They have uh, bred the red heifers that they will need when they rebuild the temple to engage in their ceremonies and sacrifices. And they uh, are all set up to do it. Those are... Ashkenazi Jews primarily, and they are Hasidic Jews descended from uh, the Frankists. The Dernme are very different. They have their own Messiah that they want to anoint. And then there are the Sephardic Jews. Um, there's also another school that thinks it's going to be one of the Rothschilds. Um, and again, there's uh, the Sephardim, who again were those uh, Spanish Jews, they're considered Oriental Jews. They have their guy. Nobody knows who that guy is. And they have a uh, saying that um, those who say do not know, and those who know do not say. They want to keep it uh, very secret. There are certain tells, um, going back to um, Gomer and... Um, some of the Old Testament characters, they always had this idea that the Messiah would be a terribly corrupt person and that he would be married to a prostitute. Uh, you can see in some of the Gnostic literature that Jesus was married to the prostitute Mary Magdalene. Um, Shabbatai Tsevi married a prostitute. Um, Moses Hess, who... Um, was considered uh, considered himself to be sort of a messianic figure, married a uh, Gentile prostitute. So his wife should be a Gentile and should be a very loose woman if they maintain that tradition. He himself uh, should be a very immoral figure who presents himself as if the height of morality. So uh, perhaps they will follow that pattern. Another tell will be whoever it is who starts uh, reproducing himself through his skin cells and seed in these laboratories and produces uh, androgynous creatures who are supposedly immortal. They are also working on technologies to uh, make human beings immortal. Jared Kushner has discussed this idea that uh, we will be the last generation to uh, have people who die and that uh, he wants to maintain his health because uh, this generation may obtain the technology to become immortal. So to answer your question, 
they know there is somebody. And you can tell by their urgency in trying to rebuild the temple, trying to reestablish the Levitical class out of Jewish men named Cohen, uh, the fact that they have remade all of these golden utensils, bred the red heifers, et cetera, et cetera, means that they want to pull the trigger on this and get it done. And whoever that Messiah figure is wants this done in his lifetime. And that is uh, probably why we're seeing all these machinations to bring the world into World War III and uh, the third war of the War of Gog and Magog. For a very long time, at least 1,500 years, they've had this mythology that there will be three world wars, which will be the three wars of Gog and Magog. It was um, asserted in the Midrash to Hillam uh, 1099 that these three wars would take place. This was interpreted by the Chabadniks and by the leading rabbis during the First World War to mean that the First World War would only be the first, that there would be a second, which would be more severe and intense and create even greater hardship. And then following the second, there would be a third World War. And they were saying this uh, as World War I was taking place and in between the two wars. And they... Um, they predicted the exact dates of each of the three um, wars of the three wars of Gog and Magog. Uh, there was a good book written by a rabbi called Redemption Unfolding, which discusses everything that I just said. I mean, that makes 100% sense. Three would be a completion number. Three is the Trinity. You know, it, it makes logical and common sense that the the third world war is definitely coming and a lot of people and in the first world war you had the sacrifice of the goat to satan which was the armenians uh there was a second goat which was the twin goat the two goats represent the twins esau and jacob born to rebecca and isaac uh esau was said to be hairy like a goat uh, it relates to seir um it would take too long to explain it all but anyway, there were two goats, and those represent the two peoples, the peoples of Jacob, uh, which is the Israelites, and the people of Esau, which is the non-Israelites. Uh, one goat is given to Satan in the wilderness. That was the Armenians and uh, those slaughtered by the Bolsheviks, etc., cetera, et cetera, and those killed in the world wars. The other goat was uh, slain and its blood spilled on the horns of the altar in the temple. And that represents Jacob, who was the Jewish people who were mass murdered in the Holocaust. So those two sacrificial offerings, which could not be offered in the temple because the temple was destroyed, were no longer animal sacrifices. They were human sacrifices and they have been perpetrated. That forms an ultimate Yom Kippur where um, the Israelites have been redeemed, fully redeemed, and they are now prepared to create the world to come, Olam Haba. And that is, uh, in my view, the most dangerous situation we could imagine because of what it uh, implies is about to happen. So who is going to be, what is going to be the third goat that's going to be sacrificed? There is no third goat. Um, what is um, the final redemption is the third world war. So we had the goat given to Satan in the first world war. We had the goat given to Yahweh in the Second World War. The Third World War is the one in which Christ returns as the Antichrist uh, in the form of Vladimir Putin, uh, in the form of Donald Trump, in the form of whoever it is who instigates a nuclear war. And it is uh, Christians fighting Muslims, Muslims fighting Christians, Christians fighting one another. And I have all kinds of... Um, statements saying that that was the plan all along that was the plan when islam was initially uh created christians were referred to as the leviathan muslims were referred to as the behemoth the plan was for the behemoth and the leviathan of the book of job to fight one another and consume one another in their battle they would fight to the death and kill one another off and that would leave Jacob standing in Palestine to rule the world from Zion. And I have the express plan stating exactly that. There is also a passage 
in Deuteronomy. Let me think. I think it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, which states that the ox and the donkey are not meant to be yoked together to plow the fields. They refer to uh, Islam as uh, the donkey, as Ishmael, who was called the donkey. They refer to Christianity as Esau, who is the ox. Um, the Kabbalist, the Gaon of Vilna, specified that the worst thing that could possibly happen is that the ox and the donkey be yoked together, which Deuteronomy says they cannot do because then Christianity and Islam would unite against Israel. So their goal was always, and they stated this expressly, to pit Muslims and Christians against one another so that the Leviathan, the serpent, Jesus Christ, who is Satan, would battle the behemoth, the ox of, well, in this instance, the ox of Islam, and they would kill each other off. And then we have uh, the fourth uh, faith that comes in, which is communism. And they established the system of mutually assured destruction. And we now face the threat that that uh, mutually assured destruction will take place. So the Third World War is not about the goat. The Third World War is about the Messiah, son of Joseph, um, battling with Armalus and King Shiroi, who is the king of Persia, Iran. All of this was foretold in the Zohar and the Sefer Zarababel uh, more than a thousand years ago. They have been planning this. They have been saying that Russia will play the role of Gog and Magog, and um, they have it all set up, and then they, we are at the precipice of them carrying it out. So it's not about uh, sacrificing the goats anymore more so much as uh, completely eliminating chaos from the world and creating a new order of Olam Haba, the world to come. And in order for, for that to happen, the kalapat, the shells of chaos, have to be completely cleared from creation so that the darkness can fully shine absorb all of the light of order and create the eighth candle on the menorah, which represents the shining darkness that lights all the other candles of the seven days of creation. And then creation will be rectified. The world will be perfect. And the 600,000 immortal androgynes will reign in peace. And it will be an era of peace because there will no longer be any combatants the Leviathan and the behemoth will have consumed each other. And another part of the mythology is the wedding feast of the Christ at which they then eat the dead bodies of Leviathan and the behemoth in a great feast, which is a feast of bloodshed in which the Antichrist exterminates humanity for their benefit. Wow, that's a lot of information to take in. Um, uh, and if anyone is doubtful, please read my book, Forbidden History of the Armenian Holocaust. And I have it in their own words that this was the express plan. Yeah, let people know where they can find that. And uh, I'm going to wrap up with uh, one last question for you, but let them know really quick where they can uh, get your book at. You can find it at uh, cjbbooks.com. That is the top book on the list on that website. Below it, you'll find a book called Beware of the World to Come. Uh, that will also help to prove to you all of the esoteric things I've been discussing about androgyny. That is one of the main themes of that book. And I have all the quotes from the Gnostics, the uh, Christian Kabbalists, the Talmud and the Zohar, etc., cetera, um, talking about this idea that the perfect state of humanity should be the restoration of Adam as an androgyne. That is the information that I have discovered too, and I believe that you're spot on with that. So earlier, before I let you go, uh, before we wrap up, I got uh, one last question for you. Earlier, you were mentioning this chariot, and we were talking about the Merkaba. Now, in the book of Enoch, it talks about that Enoch was seeing what wheels within wheels coming out of the sky. And a lot of people have described this as like a, a form of 
a, a UFO that is proof that these uh, that Enoch was seeing some kind of UFO, some kind of technology. And uh, it, it's really, really interesting verse if, if people are having, a lot of people have talked about it. And I'm sure people listening to this already know about the book of Enoch. And that's and in uh, that. Ezekiel, even prior to Enoch, that the uh, Merkabah was wheels within a wheel. Yeah, the, the book of Ezekiel has it too, and the beans with the three different heads, one of an eagle, one of an ox, and I can't remember what the uh, the other animal was in there, but uh, very interesting. What, what do you think that that was symbolizing? Do you think that that was uh, something real that, that happened? Was it a technology? Was it the, the spinning Merkaba? Was it the chariot of fire that's been referenced in the Bible several times? I think what it refers to is the concept of a fixed earth and the uh, heavens revolving around the earth and this concept of the seven planets um, that becomes in Kabbalah, the androgynous sun of the Zer Anpin, which are the six sephirot below the top trinity of Keter, Chochmah, and Banah. And then at the very base, you have the seventh, which is Malkut, the kingdom, which is the earth. And the Merkava is the ascent up what became in Kabbalah, the Sephirot. Um, it is the ascent across the seven planets to reunification with God that uh, is referred to as Jacob's ladder. In Christianity, Jacob's ladder becomes Jesus Christ, which is the gnosis, which enables one to pass through those seven gates on the ascent uh, back to the gods in heaven. And that chariot is uh, the wheels of those seven planets. In ancient Egyptian mythology, you had the journey of the dead in the underworld, and in the pyramids, they would write the Book of the Dead on the walls of the pyramids, giving the instructions of how to pass through the gates. You would have key words that you would give to the demons and angels to enable you to pass through. Uh, in Orphic Greek mythology, they had the golden tablet, which would give you instructions on how to pass through all those gates. In Kabbalah and Merkaba mysticism, you again have to pass through uh, these seven gates. You have to have the passwords. There are angels and demons. And in each of the sephirah, uh, you need uh, the wisdom, understanding, and most importantly, the knowledge of deat to uh, engage in this journey. When you reach the seventh one, you reach the great abyss, which is the dark night of the soul. You have your evil inclination, Yetzer Hara, which is Satan and chaos, tempting you to go back to the serpent at the base of the tree and to give up your journey. You then have the good inclination, which is the eagle telling you to continue to fly up into the heavens, cross over the abyss in which Deat is buried to the divine realm and reunite with God. And that is what Merkaba mysticism is all about. Opposing that is the left-hand path, where you listen to the serpent. You uh, want your body to survive. You want to oblige the lusts of your body for sex and food and for power and material gain in the material world. So instead of descending from Malkut, up the Zer on pin to the heavenly realm to become a righteous prophet. You instead delve into hell through, uh, and again, you pass through the um, 10 kelepotic equivalents of the Sephirah, the vessels of darkness. There again, you meet demons. You have to um, be very careful what you do and what you say and how you react to these demons. You can give them passwords as well. You can invoke uh, the divine name. You can invoke the divine name backwards, which is the name of Satan. And eventually you will enter into the very center of hell and meet Lucifer and become a god. So you will have absolute separation from God. You will become the number 11 instead of dealing with the number 10 and the number 
one you will become the eleventh a god of your own. Very, very interesting. That, that number eleven. Which my friend Paul Knight has uh, attributes the number eleven to the god Yanis. Uh, you know about the god Yanis at all? Um, the I know the Yanis Gesicht, uh, the uh, Janus face, where one face is. <laughs> one way and the other faces the other way and at yeah. the temple the door would be open um when there was war and closed when there was peace or vice versa and uh it was always open except for i think one day in roman history yes <laughs> that's spot on thanks so much uh christopher i appreciate you coming on my show uh wonderful conversation love to have you back on sometime in the future and we could probably go on for another uh hour here but i think this is a a good spot to uh, shut it down. Let people know again, uh, any social media that you want to plug, any website that you want to plug where people can find your books. And I'll put them in the description for everyone to check out. Uh, primarily, I hope that people visit my website, cjbbooks.com and uh, browse through my books and find what interests them. Uh, I'm on Twitter as CJB Books. I'm also on YouTube as CJB Books. And if they want to contact me on my website, cjbbooks.com, there's a contact page where they can get my email. Thanks and so much. I want much. to thank you so much for having me back and uh, in, uh, asking such wonderful questions that invoked uh, my thought process and my responses and enabled me to explain all this. You're welcome, my friend. I appreciate you a lot. All of the links to all of Christopher's information will be in the description of this video. If you want proof of everything that he's saying, he's written it all out on his website and his uh, books. For everyone else, thanks for watching and listening. Uh, much love to everyone in the chat. Please be sure to hit the thumbs up button and help the channel out in the YouTube algorithm. Share, subscribe, hit the bell icon as well for notifications. The link to my channel on Rockfin is in the description. Sign up over there, hit the follow button for my premium content. And remember, we're not only in a spiritual war, but a war on humanity. Stay aware, stay alert, keep loving your heart for everyone, stay safe out there. And if you can see through the illusion, you are the solution. See you guys next time.